Hello, everybody. Uh, thank you for inviting me to talk. Um, I thought I'd, my bio is very, very brief. Pretty much everything I did uh, came from my research community. And nobody owes more to it than I do. I'm not going to talk much about the research community, uh, Xerox Park and ARPA, but occasionally I'll refer to it. And the, uh, the talk today really is in three short parts because I would like to get to the question and answer session. I think that would be the most interesting for, for all of us. Uh, I'm going to try and get through the talk uh, quickly enough to leave time for questions and answers. And uh, maybe some of the things I say will help with the uh, questions and answers. So uh, three parts are about uh, pollution in software, uh, the kinds of poor thinking that humans do that gets us in trouble, especially in software and other parts of the world, how to find better problems to work on than the ones most of us pick, and then we'll get into the question and answer session. So the first uh, idea about pollution here is this very old slide that goes all the way back to the 1950s of a cartoon character named Pogo looking at all the trash and he says we've met the enemy and he is us and that's even more true today because the amount of trash we have is much much larger in fact we can see that just one of the trash cycles in the middle of the Pacific is almost the size of the United States. And this is just the surface that we can see. So they estimate that perhaps 85% of it is below the surface. And whenever I see pictures of this, uh, it kind of makes me think about software. It's just a really immense amount of it, bigger than most countries. And one of the reasons we have it, it doesn't seem like you have to do any real thinking to use trash, make trash, throw it away, put it somewhere else. And it just gathers up and gathers up. And of course, computing is that way. Most of the software that's made in the world is not done thinking about the future. And in fact, most of the costs of doing software are because of what wasn't done in the present to make the 85% of the costs of software in the future much, much lower. Instead, everything is done right now in the present. It's done too quickly. And we wind up with this immense amount of tra trash. And of course, the software doesn't go in the middle of the Pacific Ocean. So it's perhaps it's a little bit more like a slum that's the size of the United States. Perhaps we're living inside of this software trash or slum that's still running. Most of it hasn't been turned off. And there are many, many uh, places we can go with this. I'm just going to pick one for this uh, talk. So one of the historical reasons for how we get into these kinds of troubles is that in our genes, like many uh, animals, many mammals, especially primates, our natural instincts are to tinker with things poke at them, see what happens if I do this, what happens if I do that, and not worry about the consequences. It was hard to get hurt 200,000 years ago. And 
So trying this and that is something that's natural. It's not something we want to get rid of. If you don't know what else to do, it is kind of fun to tinker. But take something like clay, which resembles a computer in that you can make the clay go anywhere you want. You can push it around, you can tinker with it forever, but it's really hard to tinker it into something great. You just don't get by a tinkering into something that's wonderful, like this statue of uh, Voltaire. What you get is kind of a mess. To get Voltaire, you have to uh, learn a lot of things. You have to think about a lot of things. You have to develop skills. What you get when you tinker is something like this child making a little cup. And when you see something like this with software, you can complain and say, hey, that's, that's not good enough. And uh, these days what people say is, well, this is a start. When I complained about the World Wide Web and especially the web browser more than 25 years ago, I said, well, this is just a start. This is a start. We'll, we'll make it better. And in fact, they didn't. Many of the things that were wrong then, especially with interaction and uh, end user creation of things, are as bad today or worse. So what you get when you start off badly with a tinkering frame of mind is something that looks like it was tinkered into existence, which is great when a child does it, but you really don't want adult professionals to be putting a zillion of these out into the world. So if we come back to tinkering, historically we should ask, well, what came after tinkering? And the answer is engineering, which is making things using principles. So by trying things out, you find ways that work. You remember those ways that work, write them up. They may even be literally a cookbook or they're like a cookbook. And then you have a set of things that are likely to get you faster where you're trying to go and to get you something that's, that's better. Now you still have to make the thing. So making is part of both tinkering and engineering. But basically in any real field that involves making things, we wanna be able to move from tinkering to engineering so that the goal is engineering. And of course, even bad engineering has principles. There are bad ways to cook things using principles. So we also have to ask, are the principles good enough? And after engineering, thousands of years after engineering, the kind of mathematics that we recognize today was invented about 2,500 years ago. And it also involves principles, but the principles are about reasoning and representation. And about 2000 years later, what we call science today was uh, invented. One of the most important inventions of all time because its principles are about how we negotiate with the bad stuff inside our heads, our brains, has to deal using the kinds of belief structures and memories and everything else we have in here with the phenomena that we experience in the world. And so it winds up being a negotiation and it is a deep skill. It's not something built into the human race. It was invented very recently and it's one of the most powerful things that we've invented. It's also not understood very well. And people who are good these days work in a sweet spot of all four of these things. And if you think of yourself as an engineer these days, you still know mathematics. You still know science. You still know tinkering. You think about yourself as a scientist. You still know mathematics. You still know engineering. So where you are on this scheme depends partly on your personality. 
but basically the people who are really good use all four of these things and try to choose which ones are the most reasonable at time to time. So <clears throat> trying to get into this sweet spot is part of the idea of being uh, a modern practitioner in a, a STEM field. Now, if we look at computing and ask where is it, it doesn't look so good. It's mostly tinkering still today, a little bit of engineering, tiny about a bit of math and almost no science. And most of the engineering is in the hardware. Why is that? Well, it's because you can't get away with murder with hardware. Software people uh, can make things that are quite dangerous, but in fact, because they can be debugged and fixed and patched and so forth, they get away with uh, much more than any piece of hardware can. So much of the engineering and computing is in hardware. And the vast majority of software people think it can be done without learning about engineering, without learning about mathematics, and without learning about science. And that is kind of where this mess comes from. Now, when I started off uh, programming, I started off like most everybody else, which is not knowing anything uh, important about it. I happened to start off a long time ago, around 1961, uh, in the Air Force. But I think my situation back then was similar to what it is today, and that somebody else was choosing, for example, what computers I worked on. They were choosing what operating system. And in the case of this machine, it didn't have an operating system, which in some ways made life simpler. They chose the programming language. For this machine, it was assembly code. Development system, well, it didn't have one. The design or lack of design was represented in uh, uh, flowcharts back then, done by other people. The legacy system were huge punch card systems. And the job for us coders, coders were people who turned flowcharts into machine code. So we were essentially compilers of the higher level language of flowcharting. And nobody cared my opinions, and I also didn't know much. So that was a situation. Of course, after, after this, I went on to do slightly higher level programming on supercomputers, still mostly in machine code, um, still with uh, other people choosing the machines and the choices and so forth. So now it had happened that I'd gone to an engineering high school. And I had gotten a undergrad, an undergraduate degree in mathematics and another one in molecular biology. So I knew something about engineering, I knew something about mathematics, and I knew something about science, but it just wasn't in the computing part of things, which I used as a job to put myself through college. So I was a journeyman programmer. Then in 1966, I accidentally wound up in grad school. To, my theory was spend a year learning something about computing and avoid getting a real job and avoid going to grad school in math or biology. And by accident, I round, wound up in this advanced research projects agency research community that by 1966 had already invented quite a few things. They didn't invented the, <clears throat> the first parallel computers, real-time computers, with displays and pointing devices. They'd invented the first interactive graphics system <clears throat> of a modern kind, time sharing, uh, artificial intelligence. There was already a first little personal computer, uh, the tablet, the mouse, hypertext, and they were starting to talk about uh, making a packet switching network, which uh, was called the ARPANET. They hadn't done it yet. So that was the world that I found myself in. And 
it was full of people who were completely unlike the people that I'd worked with in the Air Force. The people in the ARPA community, they all had extensive training, and most of them uh, PhDs in engineering of some kind, like electrical engineering or mathematics or science. And what they were trying to do was to take what they knew about these developed fields, these difficult fields that have been developed over many decades and hundreds of years, and to see what they could use from this experience in this new world of computing. And so pretty much everything I had learned as a journeyman programmer was worthless. The way I went about doing it was worthless. So I wound up having to learn everything again, but this time from this point of view of engineering, math, and science that this community had done. And this community not only made its own software, made its own programming languages, but it also made its own hardware whenever it needed it. So it was basically full spectrum computing. And in order to get any kind of degree there, you had to learn how to do this full spectrum computing of hardware and software. And there are some really famous people who will be known to you today. Perhaps the patron saint of programming, Don Knuth, was there and he, his degree was in mathematics. Um, and turned himself into what I think we'd all think of as a great programmer. I thought he was, is, still hanging in there doing well. And one of the things that he tried to get people to understand is this saying, premature optimization is the root of all evil. And it, this was a hard thing for him to say back then because you could hardly get any computer back in the 60s to do anything without optimizing. They were just really slow, like they were a million times slower than your cell phone and more than a million times smaller. But Don pointed out that most parts of most programs, it doesn't matter how fast they run. What you really wanna do is get the program right identify the places that run too slowly, and then find a way of optimizing those without disturbing the fact that you got the program running. And there are many other sages back then. Here's Bob Barton, um, my vote for the world's greatest uh, computer designer, designer of the Burroughs B5000. He was a mathematician also, and one of the things he liked to drum into our heads is that good ideas don't often scale. And of course, there are many other principles from back then. I could make a, a, a three-day course out of just the principles that these people used in the early 60s. But for this talk, I thought I'd just <clears throat> stick with Don's idea that premature optimization is the root of all evil and ask, well, what is it that we should be thinking of then, because we still want to do something. And if we can't optimize, what is it that we should do? Well, one thing we could do is try designing. That's a new thought to a lot of computer people. They just jump in and start writing code and think about, well, we'll design it later, but it doesn't work so well. On the other hand, uh, you have to write something because it's really hard to design a whole system before uh, trying things out. It's too complicated. But you start designing. If we are not going to optimize prematurely, we somehow have to separate meanings from optimizations. And this is something we could bring up in the question and answer thing. Of what are the different ways of doing this? What does it mean to separate a meaning from the optimization? For now, let's just think of it as a meaning is the simplest thing you can write no matter how slow, that can be debugged and uh, allows you to know that you have this meaning captured. So like if it's, if 
your idea in one part of the thing is you have the idea of sorting, then your little module there would be the simplest way to do a sort. Could take forever to sort, but it guarantees to be able to sort. It gives you something that uh, you can use for testing things and also you can use for testing out the optimizations later. And once you have the system running, no matter how slowly, you can then carefully add in the optimizations and you can add them in in a way that they do not pollute the meanings. In fact, you can use the meanings to test the optimizations. And by testing the, the optimizations, you want to constantly be able to turn the optimizations off, see whether the syst that part of the system still runs or not, turn the optimizations on, see if you get the same results, you can have the meanings and the optimizations running at the same time until you trust the optimizations and so forth. So there's a whole scheme of things you can do here. Um, and in fact, these kind of things are done in regular engineering disciplines, what I call real engineering. So the designing and separating meaning from optimizations is called computer-aided design in uh, regular engineering. These lead to simulation. So you want to simulate everything before you commit to doing the much larger work of packaging. So you have to have a way of simulating. What does that mean? Well, we can talk about that. When you add the optimizations in, you better add them in through the CAD tool. And then let the simulator uh, worry about how you test the optimizations against the meanings. Well, you have real-time requirements and your program might be running too slowly, so you just find a supercomputer. This is what the ARPA community did. Uh, maybe they, these days as you're purchasing supercomputer time online from Amazon or Google, any organization that is targeting things like this should be paying more upfront in order to make their actual program development time uh, faster and uh, 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 with less errors. And finally, when you get everything going, what real engineering does is it starts thinking about fab. And fab sometimes requires some additions into the CAD. For instance, when you're making <clears throat> a bridge or a table where you have two uh, beams connecting each other. You might have to put a gusset in there to help the connection. The connection itself might not be strong enough. So the little things that you have to add in there, but you want them to be minor. Okay, so that is a typical thing that we find over and over again in real engineering. Electrical CAD is the way everything is done today. Nothing electrical, and especially no a uh, computer chip is done without completely simulating every aspect of it before it ever even goes to masks and silicon. Uh, every form of mechanical CAD, uh, uh, mechanical engineering is done using this and the simulations are particularly uh, critical because uh, in a jet engine, there are many parts internally in, a jet engine that are actually, uh, their melting point is lower than the temperatures that are in parts of the jet engine. And it's really interesting how you make jet engines to allow these things that would melt, not to melt. Uh, BioCAD. So here's something that's come along after computing. And yep, the biologist uh, knew enough to, for bioengineering to make real CAD systems with real simulations to allow everything to be done. Notice that all of these things are done using computer techniques, computer displays, computer power to do all of this. So the other engineering fields are using computers to really help them develop. NanoCAD. But when you look at in, if you go into most companies and look to see how people are developing software, you don't find anything like this. 
what the, what is it? Whatever it is, it doesn't look like engineering. And if you look closely, it's really a set of facilities for kind of tinkering around, kind of organizing thing, but it's mainly aimed at fab. It's much less aimed at design. Almost never, uh, almost never do you find uh, SIM as a key component. It's mainly aimed as though, yeah, we can do everything right. Uh, we're smart enough to be able to write the end code and have all of the stuff and intertwine the optimizations and so forth. Um, so this is kind of a yikes. Now, what if you don't have the CAD tools? Most people don't for software, partly because they don't exist, but even the great development systems, many people don't develop using them. Well, what if you don't have those? And what if you don't have a supercomputer? And the lesson from the past is you should still do these things. Every single one of them. You just have to put the optimizations in more carefully and a little bit earlier, but you still must do the meetings first. So this is a discipline. And in fact, the difference between tinkering and engineering and math and science is the three math, engineering, and science. They're disciplines, and you have to be disciplined when you're actually using them. So why don't most computer people do this? Well, let me, there are lots of reasons, but I'll just pick one is, part of it is because our brain really doesn't want to do all this work. That's why it's a discipline. So we're actually poor thinkers. And we have about 200 known ways that we think poorly. So I'm just going to pick one way, one little part of this very complicated set of bad machinery we have between our ears. And I'm going to use as an analogy our thoughts or our context as being like a flat surface. It's colored pink here. And our thoughts will can move around the surface like an ant crawling on a table. We can pick different directions. If we find an obstacle, we can figure out how to go around it. So notice everything that we're doing here is like what we call thinking, but every single thing is pink. And we don't know it's pink because we've never seen anything but pink. So this is a context that we think of as reality rather than something that we believe in or something that we've only been brought up in. Okay, so the other thing is, uh, in, when we're seeking goals, we tend to cling on to our goals very, very strongly. So if our goal is B, and we will often pick B because we're looking in that direction and there's a B in there, so let's try and get to it. We'll start working on it, but in fact, the problem space might not actually be flat. It just seems flat to the ant. So we start moving towards B and all of a sudden it starts getting really difficult. And then we slide into uh, a ditch. Why are we having so much trouble? But we keep on fighting towards B, partly because in school, we've been told we must solve this problem. And again, these problems are usually given to us by other people. Why do we cling so strongly to these things? Well. Let's go to Africa here for a second. And here's a hunter who wants to catch a baboon. And the way he's going to catch this baboon is he digs a hole in this. Baboon. So let me just tell you, I won't tell you what, what happens after. You can find this uh, movie on YouTube. And uh, the baboon does not get hurt. 
the hunter had a really interesting reason for wanting to capture the baboon and you'll find that out. But for here, uh, what we need to understand is the seeds. This cognitive uh, glitch, which we have, baboons have, and many other animals have, is called loss aversion. Once we have something, we don't want to let it go. It becomes much more valuable, more valuable for, to this baboon than his life, because the hunter might have wanted to kill him and eat his brains. Same thing with us. That goal becomes more valuable to us sometimes than our life. And often uh, prevents us from actually solving <clears throat> problems uh, that need to be solved. Well, if you knew more, like if you're actually a, an explorer, you know, well, when things get tough, maybe we should re just explore around. Maybe we don't have to go up over this hill and then down in the valley and back up in the hill and stuff. Maybe there's a way around and this seems like, well, we're going, we have to go away from the goal to do this. Yeah, you have to go away from the goal and it's, it's gonna take you a longer distance to get to the goal. But in fact, it might take you less time and less effort to get to the goal. And in fact, by looking off to the side, boy, there might even be a super highway. I've colored it blue because that's my color for science. Science is a super highway. Again, you get go off out of your way, you get onto this thing, you can go three times as fast and you get to the goal faster. But if you start using science, you might decide to invent a plane, just fly over the darn thing. But once you start doing science, you've got this even bigger idea is, wow, there might be a non-pink world. There might be a whole blue world up there and only in this blue world is there a goal C. That's the one I really wanted and I didn't even know it. And by the way, if you think about this in terms of your education, if you went to a, a really good university, then you probably went in there with some goals like B, a really good university will change you so much that it will show you things like C and your life will never be the same again. So this idea of getting trapped in a context and the idea that there are other contexts and it takes some real effort to get out of the context that seems real to these other contexts that might be more powerful. This is the message from this section of the talk. So how can we get in the frame of mood to try and find these bigger goals, these bigger visions? Um, and again, this is a huge area, but one of the things uh, I was interested in, still am, uh, is the idea of personal computing. Back in the 60s, we used to say to people, well, person is the first word in personal computing, so you better not try and do personal computing if you don't understand uh, persons. And of course, most computer people today do not understand uh, people at all. And so the, uh, most of the apps that are done are, are, have terrible user interfaces and are actually not very good for people. So this is a first lesson. But in fact, this is a little bit of a red herring because a person all by themselves is being punished. Solitary confinement, banishment. We actually exist in a society of people. And so when we talk about personal computing, we have to talk about humans in a culture. We have to understand what humans are that we share with other humans, the thing that makes us human. And that will give us great insights into ourselves because it's hard to look at ourselves 
when we're in the pink plane and just see anything but pink. And in a society, well, we've got duties like voting. We have duties to the next generation, whether or not we have children. Every culture has its own worldview. We need to understand those and get more powerful ones. Uh, every culture has some form of schooling. We need to pay attention to that. There's this idea of richness. Richness is outside the purely pragmatic. We have large parts of our brain that respond to art and love and friendship and many other things that are not strictly pragmatic. We need to care for those. And then we have the thing that most people are worried about way too much, which is livelihood. How can I get a job? Many people go into programming uh, because they think they can make money at it. And this is a very bad reason for going into programming. You really shouldn't. If you're not going to go into programming to try and improve the world, you should try and look elsewhere. And these things here, these seven things, are part of, especially in our day and age, are part of a much larger context of what you might call grand, deadly, important issues. I just have 12 here and you can think of more. These are the things that we have to worry about also. And these things are global now. There's a large enough population, uh, many of the uh, cultures have enough power to affect the entire world and are thus affecting all of these things for everyone. We're in the middle of a pandemic now that is now worldwide <clears throat> and it gives a, people perhaps a bit of a sense, although I think people still are not taking it seriously enough and they certainly are not taking the climate seriously enough because the, this world that we live on is dying and we are killing it. So a child born in 2020 is going to be 80 at the end of the century and you wonder what, what is gonna be left for this child. But if you're taking the point of view that I'm advocating here, the other way to look at it is, wow, 80 years, things could be much better for everybody in the world 80 years from now if we just took all of this seriously and learned how to think better. And the context is even bigger than the world. It's only been about 100 years or so since we realized that the universe is vastly larger than our own galaxy. And it's only been a few hundred years uh, since we realized we lived in a galaxy. We are now aware of most uh, people on the planet in the form of thousands of different cultures, all with different beliefs now all in communication through our technological structure. This is a self-portrait of the internet, but it stands for all of the technology that we've made over the last few hundred years. And we ourselves are a complex system and our brains are even more complex systems. So one of the contexts here is this idea that what we need to be aware of is the systems that we live in and the systems that we are. And these systems are all interconnected and intertwined. So, and most of them are invisible. So there are four ideas here. First, science is not just about finding out about how atoms work or how photons work or how stars work. Science, the larger idea of science is the set of heuristics and inventions we've come up with to get around with what's bad about our brains. This is the way to think about it. and This is why everybody should learn science. Systems is one of the strongest ways we have to think about complexity 
and almost nobody learns systems. It's not taught in classrooms, uh, at least in the United States and over here in the, in the UK. And uh, most computer people that I've talked to uh, outside of special cases like the ARPA community, uh, most computer people know very little about systems. They think programming is uh, creating an algorithm rather than designing a system and being part of a system. So this is a very weak view. Then two ideas from Einstein. We cannot solve our problems with the same levels of thinking that we use to create them. This is true of the small in computing. The way people have been going about computing are just gonna make things worse. The way we've gone about health, the way we've gone about climate, it's all gonna make things worse if we persist. And Einstein has this nice, definition of insanity, which is doing the same thing over and over and expecting different results. That's what we're doing. And again, you can if you think small in computing, that's what we're doing. Computing is hardly different today, except in scale, than it was uh, 60 years ago. It's really a shame. The scaling is just making things worse because almost anything that was done 60 years ago uh, couldn't handle uh, scale very well. Uh, we had to invent entirely new methods to do things just even like the ethernet or the internet to make personal computing and the user interfaces scale across billions of people. So scaling is another issue that we could be talking about. So, we can wind up here with uh, talking about the world's greatest hockey player. His name is Wayne Gretzky. He scored almost a thousand more goals than anybody else in history. And he was just a little guy. He wasn't big. He wasn't tough. They asked him, uh, took a lot of shots on goals. His, his, his uh, percentage of Getting goals for shots wasn't very good, and some people complained. And he said, well, you miss 100% of the shots you don't take. So his idea here is you, you have to show up and shoot on goal. You can't worry. You have to do all your planning ahead of time. You can't worry about whether any particular shot is going to go in. You have to keep shooting. And he said, well, a, a good hockey player goes to where the puck is. The great one goes to where the puck is going to be. And he didn't mean <clears throat> tracking the puck. He meant getting to a place on the ice where some teammate could pass him the puck where he would have a clean, clear shot on the goal. So he would, could understand the patterns of uh, all the players on the ice. He could see, well, if I get over there, somebody can get me a thing and then that will give me a shot on goal there. So this is a completely different way because most sports, especially sports like, uh, like hockey or football are basically tactical. Whereas uh, Gretzky was the greatest uh, player in history because he was strategic. And he furnishes a good analogy for an example that I'll end with here from Xerox Park. So the first idea is uh, uh, you have to have ways of coming up with ideas. And as I mentioned in the beginning, my way was by being embedded in this incredible community that was full of rich visions and interest in helping people. So I didn't invent the idea of personal computing, but this is what I worked on for my thesis uh, in 1968. And while I was working on it, um, I ran into Seymour Papert, who had been, he was a mathematician like me, and he had realized some really important things about computers. Uh, and how children could learn mathematics by taking advantage of what computers could actually do. And when I met him in 1968, what I saw was something that I understood 
had understood beforehand, except I didn't understand it. I was in the pink plane and Papert was in the blue plane. He had seen something that was right there in front of all of our eyes that combined what he knew about children and what he knew about computers and what he knew about mathematics that provided a glimpse into a complete revelation about how uh, children's science and math education could be changed. And that just completely blew my mind. And so on the plane flight back to, to Utah, I had a blue thought, not a pink thought. The blue thought was, oh, this makes computing really important, makes it more like reading and writing. And if it's like reading and writing, then children have to do it. And Papert is showing us how, and that means children have to have their own computer and it better be really portable because you don't want to confine them inside. They need to be able to use it outside. And ARPA was working on, uh, besides the ARPANET, working on a wireless version so it'd be connected wireless, so it'd have a flat screen display. And <clears throat> So this cartoon is what I drew on the plane back to Utah. And I started thinking about it. And because I was involved in this community, the thought process went kind of like this. Well, you have this idea, seems good, might be bad, but one of the things you should look around to see if there are any exponentials that are going to help in the future. It's not possible now. So you can take the idea out 30 years, like to 1998 or 2000, and ask, uh, what does this idea look like 30 some odd years from now? And the answer is, oh yeah, absolutely gonna happen. Moore's law will guarantee that we'll be able to do this. But we don't know how people will use it. We don't know what the user interface would be like. So then the critical part is bringing it back uh, 10 to 15 years bring it back to about 10, 10 to 15 years out. In this case, it was like 1985, 1986. Because when you can get something within 10 to 15 years, you can bridge the computing gap by just paying money. And you can build the function of a computer 10 to 15 years from now, you can build it now. Uh, it's gonna cost 10, 20 times as much it's gonna be 10 or 20 times too large. But you can build it and you can build a bunch of them. So that's what we did. We built a little supercomputer for everybody at Park. In fact, we built about 2000 of them. And this allowed us to have a window to invent the software, not just the, uh, the operating system, not just the user interface, but a whole bunch of the software that would be usable in 10 years or so from then. And this computer is about 50 times as fast as what you could get from time sharing, interactive time sharing, and allowed us to do two things. Uh, There's a whole bunch of stuff that we didn't have to optimize. We could just program the meanings of user interface ideas, hundreds of them, and do a dozen experiments a day which is what we did to invent the part GUI that everybody uses today. The other thing we could do is by optimizing uh, in the way, in both of these in the way that I mentioned, uh, that allowed us to do the applications of the future uh, in 1973, 1974. This is Microsoft Word as it existed in 1974 at Xerox Park, more than 10 years before it appeared uh, commercially. But it was quite possible to do because this machine was actually more powerful than a Mac <clears throat> or an IBM PC of 1984, 85 or so, right? So the simplest way to think about making progress here is always find ways of computing in the future. And even if you don't have a supercomputer, there are ways you can compute in the future because you can make a future kind of architecture just using software alone that is gonna get you much further along. Okay, made it to the question and answer. And with that, I'll turn it back to my friends uh, 
uh, for the next phase of this talk. Thank you very much. Buen día, bienvenidos, bienvenidas al tercer día de Nerdearla. Arrancamos con todo. Ayer nos fuimos allá, acá arriba y hoy arrancamos de vuelta así eh, con la charla de, de Alan Kay. Obviamente esto es un privilegio, un honor. Y ahora obviamente llegó el momento del, del Q&A. Bien, obviamente yo no soy digno para hablar con Alan Kay, así que esta conversación la va a llevar adelante el, el genial eh, Hernán Wilkinson, que va a estar básicamente charlando con, con Alan eh, y después vamos a estar tomando algunas de las preguntas. Siempre recuerden las preguntas que vamos a tomar de, de la audiencia. Es en la sección preguntas de su app card, pónganlas, eh, redactenlas bien, ¿sí? que se las pueda entender y las más votadas son las que se van a ir pasando. Así que toda esta conversación obviamente va a ser en inglés, así que ahora vamos a cambiar y le voy a dar el paso a Hernán. Uh, Hernán, Alan, can you both hear me okay? Yes, yes. Good. So, Again, thank you so much for being with us, Alan. And so, as I was saying, I am not worthy to take this conversation. So I will just let you talk with, with Hernan, okay? <laughs> I, I, I'm not worthy either, but anyway, I'll, I'll do it. <laughs> so, <laughs> no, no, no. Well, thank you, thank you very much, Alan. It's, it was amazing, the talk. I, I always enjoy your talks. Uh, it's a new way, you, you always give us new ways of thinking and new ideas, and, and that's great. Not too many people do that, so that's amazing. And I'd like to start talking about science, because that's something that I, I know you like, and you talk about it also. And, uh, you know, you, you always encourage think that scientific thinking in, in people. And I remember uh, an example that you gave in the Squeakers DVD like 20 years ago to Quincy Jones, <laughs> where you you show, you know, you told us that uh, we, science can broad our vision. And in that way, we can, you know, uh, see beforehand things that is, is going to happen a long time from, from now, like, for example, AIDS and so on. Um, uh, but in your talk, you also mentioned that we don't understand science very well. So my question is, why is that? Why is it so difficult for us to understand science and to think scientifically? And how can we change that? Well, I think if we look historically, um, and if we think about science as what we think of as modern science, we it started really uh, 400 or maybe 450 years ago. Now, the Greeks had scientists, but they didn't have science because science is not just individual scientists, but it's also a community that helps debug fondly held notions that uh, people as human beings have, mm. right? So scientists are humans as well. And so uh, they like their own theories. And one of the one of the hallmarks of the existence of science is debugging of ideas and even ideas that seem to be backed up by experimental evidence. Mm. The idea is it's not just about <clears throat> what one person uh, thinks is going on or tries to demonstrate is going on. And if you go back historically, we can trace back humanity at least several hundred thousand years. We know that the, uh, the female line of humanity goes back 200,000 years. Mm. And so anybody, I think, should ask the question, well, how, how could it possibly have taken us 200,000 years to invent science? <laughs> What was so unobvious about it? And part of the answer is uh, our social uh, cultures relied on uh, storytelling, so mm -hmm. regular language convolved with storytelling and using stories as a way of remembering things and explaining things. And a story is like math. It can be consistent, but it doesn't have to have anything at all to do with the real world. <laughs> and the other part of it is if you look at optical illusions, the thing that anybody who experiences an optical illusion has to realize is, oh, I'm not seeing what's out there at all. I just think I'm seeing what's out there, but actually what I'm seeing is something manifested inside my own head. Mm -hmm. 
and that's why I'm seeing some sort of parallel. You know, the simplest one is just measuring, yeah. holding up your thumbs. Yeah. And I can see in the in the video that the the closer one is about half the size. But in fact, what I'm experiencing is the closer one is about 80% of the size mm -hmm. because our brain knows they're the same size. <laughs> and so I'm seeing something about a third of a second late that is a manifestation of a combination of my beliefs and understanding with some in input from the outside world, putting together into a kind of a story which is presented back to me as reality. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and of course, the you know, right now we have a perfect example for the world to see in the American president that we have, who basically, like all humans, but his in a very public way is projecting his beliefs out onto the world and taking that as his reality. And that's basically what humanity is all about. And you see it in computing all the time. Also, if you just look at the comment section in any uh, slash dot or stack overflow or any of this stuff, you see people constantly projecting their own beliefs and desires as reality. So uh, it also happens that this is the 400th anniversary of one of the major uh, starting places for science. So in 1620, a guy in England here by the name of Francis Bacon wrote a book uh, called The New Organization of Knowledge, Novum Organum Scientia. Science actually meant knowledge mm. and the gathering Good. of knowledge. It doesn't didn't mean back then what we mean it today. And in this book, he points out that humans are terrible thinkers. <laughs> in a many, many ways. He picks four, his four favorite ones are we're terrible because of our genetics. In other words, our brains weren't made to think, they were made to do something else. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Our uh, cultures weren't made to think, they were made to survive. Our languages were made for telling stories, not for representing ideas very accurately or being able to use language to help think. And then our academics, our teaching uh, facilities uh, will often teach ideas that have long been debunked. So, so we, we, are, we, are, we are doomed, basically. <laughs> yeah, close, close to it. So, so what, uh, what Bacon called for is what he said was, we need a new science. And what he said is what, what science is, what this new science is, a new way to get knowledge is basically a, to come up with all the heuristics and methods we can come up with to get around with what's wrong with our brains. Mm. So this is the big idea about science. And it's not taught in any school in the United yeah. States that I know of. No, I, no, we are not even close to that. I mean, yeah, no the big way. idea about science is not about... Uh, no, life on Mars. Mm -hmm. And certainly not what you find in a science museum. The science museums in the US and the UK have hardly any science in them at all. They're full of technology, mm. which isn't the same thing at all. But Bacon's idea was much larger. So just to make everybody feel better or maybe worse, uh, the this 400th anniversary of some of the most important ideas of the last 400 years has not been mentioned once in any of the British papers. So the, the people in the UK are as innocent of scientific knowledge and history as everybody else in the world. And they have no idea that science actually for real got started here. Similar to what happened to us in our field in, in this software development with, uh, you know, the, the people that well, created software it. Software development is, is, has even a bigger problem, which is because uh, when you start off with software, you're starting off with something that probably isn't going to kill anybody. Yeah. So it's not like building a big bridge or building an airplane mm -hmm. or something. And, so you don't really have to know very much about engineering to write a program. 
Yeah. And you certainly don't have to know anything about science to write a program. And you don't have to really know anything about math to write a program. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, uh, because simple programs will still do something. Uh, it's a little bit more like this game that was around for a while called Gu Guitar Hero. Yeah. Where yeah. you could pretend to be a guitar player. And things would, things would happen. And a lot of the attraction of programming uh, when the 80s started up and the attraction of the 8-bit micro computer was just to touch it. Just yeah. to feel part of this thing that was happening. The problem is none of the content happened, and this is very common in pop cultures. Mm. So pop culture will develop its own music, which is usually much, much simpler than uh, developed music. It'll develop mm -hmm. its own notions of knowledge and science. And you can see it uh, for all over the world through uh, social media, right? So this is a universal publishing system as viewed by uh, by the majority of people who haven't had the good fortune to undergo education in basically the 20th or the 21st century. So we have yeah. this enormous culture that is not very far really from the Middle Ages. Uh, <laughs> And we can see that by looking at how most of the world and most of the world's leaders have reacted to uh, the COVID-19. The COVID, yeah, that's right. Because yeah. anybody who's actually understood an eighth grade biology course these days knows, ex should know exactly what's happened. There's nothing that tricky about it. Mm -hmm. Real mm -hmm. question is uh, how infectious is it really? But as far as what uh, a contagious, deadly disease without a cure can do, it should be something that every adult uh, on the planet, at least in the first and second worlds, should be able to respond to well. Now, New mm -hmm. Zealand did a great job. Yes, yeah. Uh, they had the right kind of leader. The leader was able to get business people and the politicians of both parties together and get everybody to agree to this. How she did that, I'm not sure. <laughs> but she did do it and yeah. the results are there. So if you prorate New Zealand's 25 deaths with a population of 4 million, you can see that almost every other country in the world has been needlessly killing off yeah. tens of thousands to hundreds of thousands of people uh, unnecessarily just because hardly anybody is educated enough in something that you learn in uh, seventh or eighth grade biology. So yeah, this is or because huge... business was more important than life, basically. Well, I don't think they think of it that way. Uh, you don't? No. They, they just don't see it. I think if you held a gun to the head of a businessman yeah. and said, would you rather live <laughs> or would you rather uh, stay in business? I think they choose life most of the time. Yeah, yeah. most of the so, time. Yeah, most of the time. And there's a famous there was a famous joke which I is told better in the U.S. Okay. Uh, which I won't won't tell here, but it was quite <laughs> funny about that. So no, I think the big problem is the lack of imagination. Mm. So if you think okay. about what can our brain imagine readily? Well, we can re readily imagine gods and demons. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and We've never seen them. <laughs> but these are things that are part of our subconscious. And so, and we have experienced them in dreams. So we can imagine things like that much more readily than we can anything that... That is related uh, to science is, or to things scientifically. Yeah, if it's if it's really small, if it's really fast, mm -hmm. if it's really new, mm. and this is so, where Bacon comes in because what Bacon said is, okay, or, or let me just sum it up in a sentence here, so we can go okay. to the next question is yeah yeah so uh, you know the term artificial intelligence is used widely and very loosely these days, but if you think about it. What is, what is artificial intelligence? Well, it's 
artifice means making something. Mm -hmm. You have a mechanism. So somehow you're trying to make some sort of uh, process that is going to act intelligent. And let's say we're not impressed with any such process unless it's more intelligent than a human. Mm -hmm. And so if we look for something on the planet that is an artificial process that's more intelligent than any human, there's only one. And that's science itself. Mm -hmm. Science is a better scientist than any scientist. <laughs> and science itself is that process that makes a group of people much more intelligent than human genetics, human culture, human language, and human academics. And so, uh, so this should be a simple idea, but partly be because of the way uh, education goes, uh, science has been relegated to just another belief system. Yeah. And yeah. it is a belief system, but it's a belief system that's backed up with a lot more than most of the other belief systems. And, and, so, and that can reflect on itself and it can change based yeah, on well, most, many mistakes that it makes and those things. So I don't that's have basically to, what other belief systems don't do, like religions. Oh, not really. No. Uh, I think... Argentina is a Catholic country, and uh, yeah, the most, one of the most famous philosophers in history was St. Thomas Aquinas. Mm -hmm. And reflecting on Christianity from the standpoint of Greek philosophy was exactly what he did do. Mm -hmm. So you don't want to you don't want to use that. <laughs> that thing. That, the, the thing that's interesting about science is the particular methods it uses to try and deal with the noisiness of our human brains. It's, a, mm -hmm. it's basically an error correct, detecting and correcting <laughs> system if you learn how to do it. And it's basically a skill. So it's not something, you know, and some people, it's like in music, some people have a little more talent than others, but in developed music, talent won't do it. You, think you have to practice and develop right. the skills. And the same thing is true for thinking and thinking is uh, in the large is primarily the province of what what science is about. Mm -hmm. So in computing, uh, you can hardly see this recently. Recently, meaning the last thirty or forty years. So the in the sixties and seventies, I started in like nineteen sixty one or sixty two. The people who are doing what we would call computer science today and what we call software engineering today, started off as real scientists and started off uh, as real engineers. Yeah, so there weren't, weren't right. any undergraduate degrees. That's right. There, there was no, no yeah. uh, programming career or computer science career. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. And so the people who went into it were interested in it. And just like... They did it from was, another perspective. And that allows them to to see other stuff well, that we as special, developers don't see. It was a special thing because don't forget there was still IBM. Yeah. Back yeah. there, and there was I, I learned to program in the military, in the Air Force, and the programming there was just as uninspired mm -hmm. as it is today. Yeah. What was special uh, was that the the research community that I just luckily stumbled into in the mid 60s, had started thinking about what the computer actually meant. Mm. And for them, it was the next 500 year invention after the printing press. And many of the things that were gonna be important were how it could go qualitatively beyond the civilization building inventions of the past several thousand years, like writing. Mm -hmm mathematics, science, the printing press, yeah. and so forth. And that was, they caught on to this idea. And IBM did not have this idea. The mm -hmm. Air Force did not have this idea. But these people did. And because they were in a good place and because the Cold War was going on, there was extra money in the Department of Defense. Uh, one of the people who had this idea got funded in a mm -hmm. big way. 
and he spread it around. And the result is most of the technologies that we use today, which are not yeah. invented by IBM, not invented in the Air Force. So this was a fortunate thing. The processes that led to those inventions hardly exist today. Yeah, and we don't see those kind of research in, in current industry yeah, at all. Yeah, it, it all the opposite is all the opposite. Just short term, I want to do this yeah. very fast and yeah. So but, talks, the talks yeah. I've given about this in the past, the line I put up on the screen is the goodness of the results correlates most strongly with the goodness of the funders. Mm -hmm. So the rarest thing is a good funder because if you look at the bell curve, at the top of the bell curve in every generation, you're going to get, uh, you know, super clever people mm -hmm. to draw on. And so the thing that was different than was not us. We just happened to be the lucky people there. The difference was in, in the funding. And the funders found us and uh, encouraged us to follow our instincts. And That's so right. we got what we got. That's what we don't have today. Yeah, that's right. So let me go back just one more question about science and then we can go to, to software and, and that stuff. So let, let, me, let me play a devil's advocate here, okay? I, <laughs> just for a little bit. I'm not sure if I can do it right, but anyway, uh, you know, science is great. You mentioned it as the most, one of the most important achievements of humankind. And, uh, but science is what brought us here. I mean, not science, we humans using science as a tool is what brought us to the situation where we are right now with waste everywhere, with the climate change and, you know, the burning woods and those kind of things, because uh, science in, in, in some way allows us to think better how to build stuff or do stuff. But in the other way, it's like we are not ready to use that powerful tool. Well, I think uh, science, so scientific and thinking can help with the consequences of things. But the actual historical fact is that uh, uh, business technology and the industrial revolution mm -hmm. brought us to the problem we are. What, what science did was to make engineering immense and the industrial revolution that was starting. Yeah was to add on to this immensely powerful ways. It transformed engineering from something that was essentially cookbooking, making cookbooks of things that worked, mm -hmm. and doing mm -hmm. things by, uh, by principles to being able to actually derive uh, physical uh, results and estimations and uh, new kinds of materials and so forth. So science, is a culprit in the sense that it opened up the possibilities and the power ratio mm -hmm. for what uh, people can do. But basically, when I look at history, what I see is, and when I look at it today, what I see is people uh, just trying to get ahead in various ways. and. For instance, in, a, in America, I don't think most heads of businesses are really all that aware that they're part of a country, mm. uh, particularly the multinational ones. And certainly, uh, if we go back 200,000 years again, we have to look at something that we can find in all mammals that, mm. that we have also, which is trade-offs between two powerful forces that are very different. One is cooperation and mm -hmm. one is competition. Mm. Yeah. And yeah. so the, uh, in the, the more powerful one, unfortunately, is competition. Mm. In the end, it takes a very, very special person not to try and save themselves. Even though we know cooperation is better than competition. It is. And not only that, uh, you know, the reason uh, there are social species of which we are one of them is because cooperation, uh, even if you're in a wolf pack, 
yeah. allows the, the pack to survive more readily. That's and right. if you're yeah. in a baboon troop, it allows the baboon troop. So uh, cooperation evolved as uh, all the other traits evolved. Yeah. Uh, underneath yeah. that, though, is competition. And so, you know, sociologically, people feel deprived if they are put into solitary confinement mm -hmm. or banished. But as soon as they get back into society, they start competing. <laughs> right? yeah. <laughs> yeah. And it radiates out from them to their, you know, there's a saying in uh, uh, some of the Arab countries that uh, me against my brother, my brother and I against our family, our family against our neighbors, our yeah, yeah. neighbors against us. So these uh, tribal uh, identity things radiate outwards. And there have been many science fiction stories written about how to unite the human race will just uh, attack the world with aliens. <laughs> and all of a sudden, then the humanity can see itself as a bigger tribe. That's right. That and, and they get together yeah. and fight the aliens because yeah, of that. Yeah, so this, this is, the re this is uh, thinking of completely immature beings who have no real sense of of what's going on. The mm -hmm. big deal in business is, at least in America, is most of the CEOs I know are not really aware that the reason they're making money at all is because they exist within a cooperative structure that was set up uh, 250 years ago. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The wealth that they are tapping into is there because of the cooperative structure and then they're competing underneath it. Mm -hmm. So again, just to, just to finish this off, to go back 200,000 years ago, you ask, well, if we go back before there's hardly any culture, there's yeah. probably never a time, you know, because uh, primates have cultures. Oh, so before that, even no, before but, primates. But if you go back, okay, when we have, we have humans and we have almost no culture, there's almost no language. Yeah. Uh, but we ask, well, what, uh, how did things uh, manage to survive back then? Yeah. And the answer it's is genetically, we have drives to reproduce that are very strong. Yeah. We have a uh, uh, drive to find food and water. So hunting and gathering is predates any kind of cooperation. Mm. If you mm -hmm. buy yourself, you're still going to be looking for food and water. Yeah. And if you think about hunting and gathering, it doesn't scale well. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Hunting and gathering, one of the scalings of it is to steal things. One of the scalings of it is to uh, strip a cooperative area dry. Yeah. yeah. You know, so there are many, many variations of this. And so one of the complaints that you could have about school is that schools do not teach, at least in the United States, again, schools do not teach uh, the children anything important about their own species. These are kind of taboo subjects. Oh. About what are human beings actually? And we just, we aren't very pretty as a species when you start looking at it from that standpoint. But the, the good part of looking at it that way is we get to see uh, how uh, a civilization can be kinder, can be yeah. more cooperative, can be yeah. smarter, yeah. all of these yeah. things. And that is something that is, uh, you need to learn early because certainly mo I would say most American adults have no idea about this at all. Yeah. From their standpoint, they're in this battle for survival. Yeah, competition is, is being taught in high school and schools on sports yeah. and all those yeah. things instead of instead of cooperation. Yeah. 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 And the rhetoric in governments is we're not competitive enough. We're yeah. not, what how can what does that mean on a finite planet? <laughs> that's, that's crazy. Yeah, I mean, really, that's right. I mean, literally, yeah, yeah, no. 
I don't mean as a metaphor. I mean, this is, it is literally insane. Yeah, well, it's what is happening to us right now. No? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, Definitely. Seeing, yeah, and of course, the, you know, scientists were aware of the climate problems uh, starting in the early 60s. Yeah, yeah. So they, they, they knew about it, and, and the people, uh, the business people, tried to not to the, well, the idea they, to spread yeah. out. Yeah. Yeah, and it's not if the business people really understood it, they uh, could actually see one of the one of the biggest problems with lack of history um, is besides trying to avoid blunders that have been done. Hmm. earlier is that the, we also, reinvent the flat tire all the time as you say reinvent, reinvent the flat tire all the time but the other thing is uh we miss opportunities so for example mm. whenever we've had a big calamity in the last hundred or more years mm -hmm. uh usually uh things have not been prepared well enough for it these calamities yeah. are usually wars not always but, for yeah. example, the result of uh, the wars, mm -hmm. the aftermath of the wars is usually prosperity. And the reason is, is that it's in war when the, the extra invest, the kind of investment that conservative people don't like to make mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. or anything I long see. term. Yeah. When you're really in trouble, you might give a smart person you don't understand some money anyway. Just, yeah. right? And so the kind of funding, research funding that's done during a war is unfortunately almost the only good kind of research funding that, is, uh, that has been done. It's when people, this is why the National Institute of Health in the United States gets more than three times the funding than all of the National Science Foundation. Yeah. National Science Foundation funds all the other sciences. But the National Institute of Health, why? Because people are afraid of dying. <laughs> and so they're much, politically, they, they can imagine their own death, they're afraid of it. Yeah. And, and there is a goal that unites them to do that funding. Yeah. In that so case. The, the, real, the real problem with all of this, the, the problems in recreating ARPA and Xerox PARC, uh, in recent times have been that the, the mostly billionaires that have tried it, uh, they want to uh, direct the research. Yeah. And I've told any number of them, I said, well, you, you shouldn't be doing this because if you look at why ARPA and Xerox PARC succeeded, uh, the people who directed the research were the people who are going to do the research, the people who chose the problems were these uh, top researchers. That's right. And with yeah. all due respect, sir, you spent the last 20 years uh, becoming a billionaire. <laughs> Not a the researcher. Money. And so the chances that you can pick a good research problem are essentially <laughs> zero. Well, you yeah. just want to be a wannabe. You want to be part of this, and you're not satisfied with your billion. You want to do this, too, but you're incompetent to do it. So yeah. in, in government, it's slightly different uh, where the people who are responsible think they need to be in control because, you know, they are responsible. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> but the thing that made ARPA and PARC different was that the people who are responsible knew they couldn't be in control. Yeah, yeah. They were Big Lighter and Bob Taylor, they allow you to, to yeah. do whatever you want. They're responsible wanted. Yeah. for yeah. Yeah. trying to get a culture going, trying to find talent. Yeah, um, but they weren't responsible. So Taylor never suggested a single research project uh, at Park. Uh, and Licklider stayed with his vision. And people asked, "Well, how are you going to do the vision?" He said, "Well, I don't know, but I'm going to fund people who think they do know." Yeah, and uh, they'll uh, take thirty or forty percent. This is, you know, this is more like playing baseball. Yeah, so it's hard to get. And it, it is interesting because Bob Taylor was a psychologist, wasn't he? And so was Lick Leiter. And Lick Leiter, that's right. So they, they knew how people, how to get people together well, and, well, and do stuff. I think there was some of that. Uh, both of them happened to be experimental psychologists. Oh, okay. They were not clinical 
Yeah, yeah. And they were two completely different personalities. Lick was just a very nice guy. And okay. he was special, though. He, he was one of the inventors of cognitive psychology. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. he's special, but his personality was also special. Uh, Taylor was a uh, much more aggressive Mm, okay. Character. He adored Licklider. Okay. And uh, when he when he was part of the ARPA thing, he put a lot of effort into understanding exactly why what Licklider did was working so well. Mm. And mm. when he became head of head of the computing research at Park, he put those principles into action. So he was not acting by instinct. He knew how to do it. He would basically, yeah, he said, uh, this is what Licklider did by instinct. Mm. Uh, we, can, we can do this by method. Mm -hmm. We'll just yeah. do, do it this way. And Park uh, was a concentration of both talent and method. Yeah. And it was amazing, wasn't it? <laughs> well. I mean, well, everything that you've done there. <laughs> yeah. Well, I think the most amazing thing was uh, the bulk of the the work that's known today was done by you know twenty five or thirty people. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and every amazing. every part of it, and so the concentration of of abilities there was large, and the concentration of method, hmm. the Taylor's application of what he thought was a good way to do this thing was more powerful than the than the more ad hoc mm. ARPA Management. way that he'd learned from. Yeah. So, yeah, so, the re so I always, I, when I look to, when people ask me questions, I said, well, you know, don't look at us, look at, <laughs> look at the, you know, the four funders at ARPA were <clears throat> Lick Leiter, Ivan Sutherland, <clears throat> Bob Taylor, and Larry Roberts, and then mm -hmm. Taylor came and did Park. And, so if you if you want to thank somebody, thank them. <laughs> and you know, uh, when we've gotten medals in the past, uh, I mean, my line is that well, you know, you know, medal forty years after the fact is okay, but the if you if you want a real reward, think of the reward for being able to do this work. Yeah, yeah. Back yeah. then, to actually yeah. do. It. That's the in, big deal. And then yeah. as much of a reward is the fact that the funders were giving us gold medals and a lot more gold than was in the gold medals. They were giving it to <laughs> us before the fact, knowing that most of it was going to turn into lead. Mm. Mm. So yeah. when you get funding like that and you get to do the work, uh, you don't need anything uh, later. That's it. That's it. Yeah, you're in the right place, in the, you know, the right environment, and yeah, then you so create. It was, it was great, yeah. and we knew it was great back then, uh, and uh, our appreciation for it went up by about a factor of thousand after mm. it ended. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right, because I was in it. I, w I had been out of the regular culture because mm. I was in it in grad school and then uh, for 10 years at Xerox Park. And so I've been completely isolated from the outside computing culture for mm. 15 or 16 years. <laughs> and I was quite shocked. When you get out of there. Out, yeah, about everything. Yeah. <laughs> I can imagine, yeah, yeah, I can imagine. So let's go to that subject now, to software, <laughs> if, yeah. if you don't mind. <laughs> Sure. Because I know I know that you can talk for an hour by yourself, but I, I need to That's do some problem. questions, you know. <laughs> <laughs> That's the you should interrupt me. Uh, by the way, I don't mind being interrupted because I know I talk too much. Okay. Okay. <laughs> yeah, but I, I'm not sure when to interrupt, when to know. But anyway, yeah, so yeah. let's let's talk about software and, and basically software design. Uh, you know, for a long time, software design has been thought as drawing. Uh, on paper, you know, and to uh, design was to draw basically uh, what you thought the organization of the system should be while you were running the system in your head. So you were imagining the system and then 
making some draws and you know that was designed for, for a long time that was the classic idea as you mentioned for example with the flow charts in the air force uh you know that was maybe thought as design but uh, you know we know that that doesn't work at, at least what you know the history has tell us that it doesn't work so what is for you software design? Because you talk about it in your talk, you talk about CAD and those kind of things. Yeah. So what activities sh should uh, 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 should be done in software design? How can well, you tell the, us about it? I think the first thing is... Uh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry to interrupt you and to, to finish the question because you also talk about meaning, creation of meaning. Yeah. And how do you relate that to design? I, I think that the key point is there. So. Yeah, Let's well, talk about I, think, I think the first thing, the simple thing, is that uh, you know a thing I had to get over in a hurry when I went from being a, a journeyman programmer mm -hmm. in the early '60s to accidentally falling into this research community was that the the average program in the early 60s was relatively easy to do. The computers mm -hmm. were small. Mm -hmm. And so the main problem in programming back then was more than anything else was not to get completely mired in optimization. Because mm -hmm. you had yeah. to optimize, uh, you didn't have enough memory, you didn't have enough uh, cycles. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so the, the tendency was to convolve, as people do today. Yeah, yeah, we're still doing that. We're still uh, yeah. having that old school in, in our heads, yeah. 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 So the, uh, however, ARPA was uh, basically, the, the people who were our mentors, mm -hmm. the first generation people who were funded by Licklider, were yeah. basically all systems people. They they had, many systems. of them had worked on the SAGE air defense system, which was 24 installations of two computers the size of a softball, a football <laughs> field. Wow. There was one floor of a four-story building. The basement of the building was the power supply <laughs> for these computers. So we could think of two. So <laughs> Amazing. And then the, the third floor was operations and the top floor had 150 graphics terminals mm. that were run by these enormous vacuum tube computers. And uh, the government built 24 of these blockhouses. Wow. All connected into the radar systems of the, of the country. And so that's what these people were doing in the 50s. And... So the monumental scale of people who came out of World War II. And I should mention here, uh, for people who are interested in history, if you want to understand where the mental framework came from for the, this uh, research work in the 60s and 70s, it came out of the, mostly out of the radar work. Yeah. Yeah. which was jointly between uh, the U.S. and the U.K. And the U.K., done, yeah. Done primarily at MIT, mm -hmm. but started off in, in Britain. And there's a great story. There's some great books to yeah. read about it. And, yeah, and, and, there is, and there is a talk that you, you had with a, a guy like two months ago on YouTube that, where you talk about that. I've, that. I've done a couple of talks about that. Yeah. And I've written some papers yeah. about it. <clears throat> also, another monumental effort was uh, the Manhattan uh, mm -hmm. Project. So most people are, don't, Manhattan Project, they spent, you think about what the US was doing in World War II. The Manhattan Project itself cost more than 1% of all of the defense funding for World War II. <laughs> so it oh. involved uh, about 800,000 people. It involved making new cities yeah, yeah, because they went wherever they could find cooling water, and they built new cities. They brought in school teachers, they brought in doctors, they built entire cities, they built plants of 
acres and acres. They didn't know the best way to refine, get refined uh, material mm. for the for the bombs. There are four known ways, and General Grove said, "Well, let's let's just go all out on all four of them." <laughs> and he was the he was the head of this project, and so his history is worthwhile reading to read about. Uh, you know, something at scale. That scale, yeah. Yeah, and the same thing is, uh, and I've used this many times in talks, is my background partly was in uh, molecular biology, and you have my favorite book up there. Yeah, yeah. Right behind you. Yeah. And that's, that's my favorite edition of the book, the third edition. <laughs> oh, cool. I can tell you by got the, the right one, the right one. Not the right one. That's, <laughs> I think that was the sweet spot. And uh, the, the main read it yet. It's a little bit big. <laughs> one of the best reads ever. Yeah, it's about a thousand pages long. So one of the best For reads One ever. week, one week of reading. Yeah, and if you're in, uh, so if you come out of that background, computers are tiny, tiny, tiny little things, and systems are even the largest human-built systems are small compared. Yeah. to what biology pulls off. And of course, a lot of the stuff in biology uh, can't be applied to computing just because of the nature of the way the materials themselves work and what things are like at submicroscopic mm -hmm. scales. Mm -hmm. But a lot of it does. And another book that was very influential was uh, Christopher Alexander's first book, Mm. which is his PhD thesis called Notes on a Synthesis of Form. Yes. And he repudiated this book because he got hippified uh, after he went to Berkeley, mm. went into a different way. And the stuff he did subsequently wasn't that bad. But uh, this PhD thesis book was really interesting. And his, his main example done after this fascinating discourse of how you think about complexity and design and the conflicts and finding them and modularizing things. And it's just great. Mm -hmm. It's great today. It's just a great book. I, I have it here somewhere. Yeah. Um, yeah. But the end, the, the end example of it is taking the, uh, the problem of designing a new, uh, a new uh, village in India. Mm. from scratch so it's going to have a population of a few thousand people and it has you know a thousand or two constraints yeah. <laughs> of every different kind in the thing and how are you going to design this and it, this is great because this is not a typical if you yeah, look problem. at computing stuff uh people are start, taught programming on examples that are nothing like, or should be nothing like, anything they're going to do for real. <laughs> yeah, 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 that's so you're true. Much, yeah. Much, you're much, much better off dealing with this, uh, you know, if you have a live running system, like say Smalltalk, yeah. or even JavaScript, although the it's so ugly in there, <laughs> uh, but it's live. Yeah. But if you have a live system that you can look at, you're much better off learning how to program in the context of the system because then you start having to sift into just, your mind. Yeah, it's yeah. just like you Yeah, it's a different way of thinking because you have to to realize that if you change something, you can break it while running. So yeah. it, I mean, you, you know, it, you can do you can learn a little bit of driving a car, or driving around a field or a parking lot. Yeah. With no cars on it, but Really, driving is learning how to drive on a street where you have stop signs and you have that's right. Children that's to right. Worry. There's all these things you have to worry about, and it's very confusing. And the process of learning how to drive is learning how to create things in your mind for dealing with all of the heuristics that have to be done in real time. And mm -hmm. so, design is again one of these thinking skills. Mm -hmm. And part of it, part of the thinking skill is how to hold in your mind simultaneously uh, things that conflict mm. or seem to conflict rather than trying to resolve them too early. And mm. I forget whether I did it in this talk or not, but I've made the point about, you know, our ideas made out of matter mm -hmm. 
or like categories where they can't interpenetrate or they Hello. I think we I, lost. I, lost. I think we lost. Yeah. Oh, we lost you. Yes, the last. Okay. Yeah, yeah, thirty seconds. Of course, from my point. Yeah. So the question is: Are ideas made out of matter? Yeah. So one idea can't is basically antagonistic to another, or is ideas made out of radiation. So you can shine lots, lots of colored lights at a wall, and they superpose. Mm -hmm. So you can see all of them there. They don't interfere with each other. You see interesting combinations. And that's one of the states you have to get into when you design or when you think about anything. Yeah, you do, yeah. When you're dealing with complexity, the last thing you should try to do is solve a problem. The number one thing you have to do when you're dealing with complexity is to try and find out what's going on. Yeah. Try to find a way of looking at what's going on. Uh, yeah, the problem, the problem finding is test of the problem solving. Problem finding is, and that was the big, one of the big things I got in ARPA. Yeah. yeah. They realized so, problem finding is the, and so when you get to software and think about what's the software process, well, the pro software process is trying to deal with the kinds of things that Alexander was dealing with. Mm. And the first thing you have to have is some understanding of what the meaning is before you start trying to, to optimize. So Alec, so if you look at Alexander, the, the, I should have brought, brought that book. I wonder if the book. <laughs> I have it in my room. I don't have it here, but yeah, yeah. Whether I have it here. <coughs> oh my <Yeah>. God. <laughs> So this, is, this is London, so I don't have my real library here, but I have about a thousand, whoops, I have about a thousand books here <laughs> or so. Just, just a few. And I need some, of, yeah. So this book, yeah. you can't uh, praise it too highly. Yeah, yeah, I read it. It's really interesting. It opens your mind. Yeah, so here's his final design of the village. And, but uh, one of the most interesting things is how careful he is about, yeah. So Appendix 1 is the work example where he looks at hundreds of constraints and tries to put uh. them down very carefully. So wow. if, you look at, if you look at the requirements, and of course, the real question is, are you actually saying anything when you write a requirement down in a, in a natural language? Mm. So uh, the belief we had when we started thinking about this stuff, and you met, again, the uh, ARPA community invented computer-aided design. And... General Motors was doing uh, also doing a project, but I think also. it was most strongly invented in Sketchpad by Ivan Sutherland and then especially by his brother, Bert, mm. and others at Lincoln Lab. And MIT had a huge numerically controlled tool project that was also about computer-aided design. Mm. So the idea is you... And a lot of the computer graphics that was done back then was to try and see whether you could define shapes using graphics that a program could look at the shape and see what a five axis milling machine would have to do to make that shape out of a piece of metal. Mm. And so there's a lot of that. And of course, the shape that you want, like when you make a flange, Yes. Uh, that flange might not be strong enough in its yeah in, in its simple flangeness. Yeah. You might have to put a fillet, you know, which is extra metal. Yeah, to make it stronger on, on the bend part. So you can think of that as something that would be revealed in simulation. So Sketchpad, mm -hmm. when you design something in Sketchpad. 
you didn't guess you weren't just doing a drawing you would get something that could you had all the constraints and the simulation to yeah. see what yeah yeah. So, yeah. And, and, and going back, sorry to interrupt you because we're running out of time and I have a bunch of questions. Right. And I want I want to go to one, at least one or two questions from the people. I don't want to be the only one yeah, asking, yeah, yeah. but, uh, um, you know, you mentioned Smalltalk and, you know, that amazing uh, system that you created with Dan Ingalls and Adele Goldberg and among other people. And, you know, working is, with Smalltalk, as you said, it's like, working in a living system where you are changing it while, while the system runs. But also one of the main features of Smalltalk is the immediate feedback. And you you know, Brett Victor, he, he gave a great talk about immediate feedback and how important that is to design stuff, to work with stuff. So how do you see immediate feedback in, in software development? How important you think well, it I is? Well, I think that, you know, again, I, I forget what I put in my talk. <laughs> <laughs> so I, just, I just did another talk. Okay, with, okay. With no, but you didn't talk about immediate feedback in your talk. Yeah, in but I might, I might have thrown in uh, four stages. Yes, yes. Of the tinkering followed by engineering followed That's by... That's right. Mathematics. Then I was going to tell you also that you forgot art. Why you didn't no, put I, art in there also? No, it, it all is. Oh, okay, okay. Because okay. what art, art, the, the Greek word uh art comes from the latin ars okay and the the greek root which goes back even earlier is techni okay so technology literally means anything that humans make mm -hmm. anything okay including okay. painting so what what happened is in the 19th century uh painting and sculpture took the term art Oh, it used right. to be called the fine arts. Okay, okay, then, I see, I see. Yeah, yeah. it's like uh, it, it's like uh, AI used to mean something different than it does today. Yeah. <laughs> that's right. Yeah, yeah. Uh, object oriented used to mean something that so they, that's right. <laughs> that's today. So people people do this, but in fact, in many of the presentations I do, I show these four guys sitting the larger context around them is art because it's everything okay. that people, everything that people do that's yeah. that's why artificial means something special yeah it doesn't mean something bad yeah, artificial okay. means something that's made okay okay artificial I intelligence see. is an is intelligence that is made that is made yeah, yeah. so <laughs> yeah so uh, so if you look at those four things, uh, and the point I make is in modern times, you wanna be uh, in the sweet spot at the center. That's right. Yeah, that combines the, the best Venn of diagram. all of yeah. yeah, so you wanna choose, when am I gonna tinker? Mm -hmm. Scientists tinker, engineers tinker, mathematicians tinker, so you have to tinker. That's right, yeah. You have to be, you have to make things principled. Mm -hmm. It's not just in engineering, but uh, if like I have also, also have a degree in pure math, mm -hmm. so if you're going to make a mathematical proof, it's at least as engineered as a bridges. Mm. It has okay. to have that integrity of connectiveness in order to be considered a good proof. Yeah. So, yeah. you know, and then science has this extra important way of being a negotiation between what's inside of our heads and the kinds of phenomena that we deal with out there. So mm. it's it's a meta thing that's much more complex than the rest of these rest of these ideas and much more powerful. So so if you try and apply that, you try and map software into it, it's usually way off. Mm. Uh, yeah. Yeah. mostly yeah. tinkering, a little bit of yeah. engineering, yeah. Uh, hardly any math, no real science. So if you try and map that into some modern system that you might try to make, uh, one of the number one things I think anybody would do, and certainly we did what we could do back in the 70s, was to say, yeah, we have to do CAD and SIM. Mm -hmm. We have to be able to do computer-aided design, which means we have to be able to continue. It's like a computer graphics that we have to continually develop the... Okay. Thing we have in mind so we can at least fasten on the meaning 
of it. So the, the CAD part is meaning, it's semantics. And the simulation part is because beyond a few sentences, you shouldn't trust 20 or 30 or 100 requirements. Yeah, that's right. Without debugging them. That's right. So yeah, that's, that's, that's something we do actually in software development with testing. You know, uh, some, there is a technique called test-driven development. I don't know if you heard about it. Uh, yeah, but, sure. But that, the problem with that is that, you know, if it were good, let's, let's suppose you were doing it well. Yeah. Then in theory, you should be able to run, uh, you should be able to, on a supercomputer, you should be able to bring uh, the thing to life, right? If the tests yeah. are really covering everything. Uh, yeah. The truth is they don't. Yeah, no, that's right. Some parts of and, it. And, yeah. like, so it, yeah. the biggest problem with it, it's not that you don't want to have tests, but the problem is it loses the larger integrity mm -hmm. of what you need in designing a system. That's right, yeah. So yeah. It's, I, I think it's, 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 it's not that you don't want to have tests, but I think trying to start with tests is... And again, I, I, I'm, sometimes I throw in a lump of clay. Yeah, yeah, you did. I, can you, I did, okay. So, yeah. so it's pretty hard to debug a lump of clay into a, a really nice piece of sculpture. Yeah, that, yeah. Yeah, and, but you get to test everything continuously, yeah. right? Yeah, no, that's you have right. To have, you have to have a vision of what it is that you're doing. You know, yeah, so, but starting, starting with the test is like, thinking about the meanings first instead of thinking about the no no it's, it's thinking about it's thinking about criteria the, the question is is you know the way to think about the meanings yeah is to think about the simplest thing that is like the thing that you want mm. that gets you to you know so starting off uh uh asking about bathroom facilities mm. is not going to lead you to a village design no, of course. <laughs> so what you need to think about is what is the simplest thing that's like a village? Oh, okay. Okay, I see. That gives see. you a system. Okay. That gives you many of the main things that the system has to have. And then that's not going to be uh, uh, nearly detailed enough or scaled enough, but it has, it's it's a vision of the whole. Yeah. It yeah. gives you a sense of so I think we don't have too much time, so I, I'm sorry to interrupt you again. I think we need like six hours or, I don't know, three, ten days to talk about everything. You guys you know, are organizing the conference. You, you, you know too much, Alan. You know too much. <laughs> it's difficult. Sure. It's or difficult to... <laughs> but let me at least ask you one question from the audience. Um, we have one from Maximo Prieto. He, he admires you because he's an, a small talker and he, he, his question is, what can we, as simple programmers, not the owners of the business, do to provoke a change in the way we are forced to program today? I think we deserve to program in a better way. Yeah. So, well, I think that's the big problem. When I was a professional programmer, you know, with somebody else's machine, somebody else's software, somebody else's problem. So I was, you know, at the bottom of this. Yeah. Machine. Of this yeah. machinery. On on the other hand, what we did have the ability to do, and a lot of this was in machine code. Mm. But the nice thing is, uh, the machine code systems back then, uh, many of them had really good macro systems. Mm. And so anybody who wanted to survive back then, and yeah. particularly with regard to this question, the first thing we would do and it would be a bunch of us who are involved in these projects, is to spend a fair amount of our time each week, mm -hmm. often each day, working with each other on macros that would give us higher level building blocks. Oh, so it's okay. basically programming language design, DSL, mm -hmm. basically yeah. making DSLs. Hmm. And, uh, because otherwise, you're, at the, you're in the wrong place. Hmm for uh, changing your mind. So if you think about, one of the ways of thinking about this thing is, uh, and certainly was the way a lot of people approached it and the ARPA community really approached it was, 
let's admit that human beings are terrible thinkers. Mm. That means we are terrible thinkers. What can we do about that? Well, it means that most of our ideas are going to be mediocre down to bad. Let's just put that right out there. Let's yeah. not try and be, uh, uh, yeah, that's right. try and be clever. That's right. We're not, let's let's, let's not face that. it. Let's put it as a, you know, as the, yeah, yeah let's face still, it. Yeah. We still want to make progress. So what, mm -hmm. what can we do? Well, what we need to do is to be able to fix things mm -hmm. so we can change our mind. And what are those things we can do? Well, they were starting to happen back when I was a, uh, when I was a programmer. Like mm. one of the machines I programmed on back then did not have any index registers. <laughs> and, really basic. Yeah. But you, you don't need an index register. You can go in and modify addresses. That's right. Yeah. What index yeah. registers are is late binding something. Yeah. To give you yeah. both safety and a way of changing your mind more easily. Every time you use a, an indirect pointer, you are allow, uh, allowing uh, the possibility of sticking something in between. That's right. To change that, that the other way would be static, but yeah. in that way it's dynamic. So you can change yeah. it so later the, on. Yeah. The idea is virtually nothing that's important should you know the actual address of. Mm -hmm. And... Mm -hmm. One of the thing, uh, and I've mentioned this, you know, long ago, a uh, big revelation to me, although it wasn't nearly as big as it, as it should have been, became a really big revelation later on. But the, the file system uh, on the Burroughs B220 uh, yeah. uh, 220 in the Air Force. So there were no operating systems back then. And mm. They wanted to exchange tapes with files on them. And the way they hit on doing this, and I don't know who did it, but the idea was that the, and these files were long, because uh, I won't go into the weirdness of the, the tape drives back then, but so the front part of this was just a bunch of, a vac, you know, uh, an array yeah. of pointers further on down in the file into the second part of the file, which is a bunch of Burroughs 220 uh, programs. Machine code, yeah. Yeah, it was in machine code programs. Yeah. And then the last part, which could be the, the size of the rest of the tape, were all the data records. And the way you, way you uh, read a tape is the tape always got read into the same place in memory. Mm. And the only thing that was standardized was what the index positions in this first array actually mm. meant. <laughs> like, go to So it was basically a class with messages pointing to the methods. Yeah. Basically yeah. that. Yeah. Yeah. And I didn't realize, you know, and Amazing. It, was, it was great. We, we call that data driven programming back then. Yeah. Okay. Because what, what you didn't want to do is write your own code. Because then you had to understand what you need, needed to do was just understand, you know, if you want to find record 150, and of course there are different sizes, but it didn't matter because the code there knew what size these guys were. It knew mm. where, the, where the data right. were in there. Right. So nothing, nothing was fixed, but it was dynamically um, decided right. by the code. Yeah, I got there in 1961 and that was, that was already in place. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> and so that was how you did things on the on the Burroughs Burroughs 220 for Air Training Command mm. records. Mm. And but you know if you look at the principle behind it, yes, yeah, it's, it's like the principle of OOP. Yeah, that's right. Basically, yeah. you're abstracting and Sketchpad, which was done about the same time, had the same idea. It, idea. The Sketchpad object was mostly a bunch of indirect points. So the thing called display mm -hmm. in Sketchpad was just a pointer at a specific position in this data record mm -hmm. for the thing. And you just jumped indirect through it and it would take you to the procedure that was most well suited for displaying that particular kind of thing there. So mm. 
Even so though in the sketchpad, those things were more like prototypes than that classes. Is that no, right? Were, no, no. If you look, if you read the thesis, yeah, everybody should because no, he actually had uh, even something like inheritance. Oh, really? Yeah. Wow. <laughs> yeah. No, no, it was cool. uh, sketchpad. So they, they, they were not prototypes like that you clone. Because I thought that they were like prototypes that you clone to have a, a, another one and not like... No. No, okay, okay, okay. Yeah, so, but anyway, once, you know, I saw a sketch pad a few years later in 66 in my first week mm. in grad school along with Simula. And yeah. it was having seen this, this idea like five or six times in a row because the Burroughs B5000 had a variant of it also, and in some ways even more sophisticated. And I was just dumb, you know, it just took me <laughs> four or five, six times to see the thing. Then finally I realized, holy shit, this is really an enormous idea. Mm. It's not just a good idea, it is actually cosmically important. So, uh, so let, let's make a scale now. <laughs> That's what you did, <laughs> yeah. basically. Yeah, so once, yeah, and then of course, once I saw it was, cosmically important i took it out to the cosmos <laughs> yeah because yeah. you know and again again it's it's pragmatics that hurts the idea like it's the simplest idea th that there is that if you have a computer you can do any computation mm. Mm. you can represent any data structure yeah so it should be a complete instant deduction that, oh, if I want to uh, make a computing system, I should just make virtual computers. <laughs> that will allow me to define anything else. Uh, and I have a universal way of doing it. And people still don't use what they call OOP today to do that. Yeah, yeah. They just yeah. can't see it. And there's <laughs> something about a computer, even today when they're a lot smaller, that where, where the pragmatic reality of the computer, uh, you know, contrasted with what it is virtually or what it mm. is semantically. Yeah, yeah. So once, once you can move from pragmatic, so one of the ways of looking at it is one of the biggest problems in programming in every era. And I don't even know what decade this is for me. I haven't counted them, <laughs> them up, but it's gonna be 60, 60 years pretty soon. Six years next year, I think. So oh, wow. Six, six decades. Wow. <laughs> but in every year, it's the same thing. Which the is same people, problem, yeah. People get yeah. caught up with the pragmatics. Yeah, with the immediate, with the immediate tool instead of yeah. the... Yeah. And, and the number one problem with optimization and pragmatics is that once you put that hat on, and we can all do it, once you put yeah. that hat on, it is almost impossible to design after yeah. That's right. They're yeah. completely incompatible. Yeah, because so, when you're stuck with an idea, it's very difficult to change it. It's very yeah. difficult to, so the, to say, so to, to understand that you did something wrong. It's very difficult to, to see that you see to the, that you did something wrong. So, yeah. yeah. So for me, uh, you know, there are a lot of different ways of using a dynamic system. Mm. And it depends on the personality. For me, I like to do, uh, when I was, I like to do this idea of what's the smallest village. Mm. And I just do that from scratch. Okay. Even in small talk. In small talk, I wouldn't go in and define a lot of classes or any of that stuff. I'd use the a, th a thing in, called the workspace, which has yeah. an address space yeah. in it. And I would it's just- a, a repo with asteroids. What I say, like a REPL, but with asteroids, because you know, in a REPL, you're like working in one line, but in a workspace, yeah. you have the whole thing. Yeah. Yeah. You can have yeah. many, many things in there, and yeah. it has, and then its, you own, have it has its own uh, address space. And, and right. so, what I would do is just do a complete system, mm. the smallest thing that's a village and everything. I mean, I would do the, the loop, I do the user interface, I do every little thing, the simplest thing I could do trying to get into my head mm -hmm. what the uh, primary focus of the design is. Because the, the important thing about what, what OOP is, at least the OOP stuff that we did, mm -hmm. is that it's a module system. 
Mm. For us, encapsulation was 100%. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's not, it's not there. Uh, you know, occasionally you might have to fall back and define something like a data structure. But if, when you do that, you're actually uh, courting danger. Mm -hmm. Basically, it's a module system. And the problem with a module system is it doesn't tell you what modules you should come up with. Mm. Right, the module system just gives you a way of protecting one set of things from another set of things and a way of communicating between them. Mm -hmm. And that's what Alexander's book It's about. Yeah. The primary the primary content of this book, the whole front part of it, is how to think in terms of modules mm -hmm. and what mm -hmm. to do. And his his thesis program, which he wrote in Fortran, was a thing that attempted to find you the best set of modules mm. out of a complex set of constraints. Still a good idea. Yeah, yeah. But, yeah. but basically, and to me, that's getting the meaning of the thing down. So to me, okay. meanings dominate. And then you have this interesting thing. In most programming languages today, is there's nothing that, because of this fact that you can use indirections, mm. that you can have a set of meanings and they might include some tests. Mm. But if you think of the, uh, you know, suppose it's just something like sorting. Yeah. And so the, the you know, the, the meaning for sorting is that the output is a permutation of the input yeah. that obeys some, some relationship. Mm -hmm. And yeah. Prolog will even uh, sort for you. Yeah. Just on that basis, does yeah, it, it really does it the hard way? But it it gives you the and of course a permutation is not easy thing to describe. It's a trickier yeah. kind of thing. But uh, but there are fifty known ways to sort. Oh, sort, yeah. And they yeah. all have different uh, pragmatic uh, ranges. Yeah. And they have different conditions, and so you could imagine. If you're going to do a sorting thing, you have something that's going to protect the meaning. Mm. So you can grind, let it grind if you want. Yeah, yeah. It, or okay. it could be a really simple sorting program that you're sure really does sort. Yeah. Maybe yeah. or maybe combined with tests. Yeah. Maybe it's got both of these things. But you keep that over on the side, and then on the on the right hand side of the page, you write down your 50 sorting routines, and you head them with the conditions. Uh, under which they should be invoked. Mm. So they look, this is just what we did when we were writing macros in the Air Force. That's we right. Looked at, basically, look at the inputs. Oh, this is an enormous array. So uh, I better not do a bubble sort here. <laughs> or uh, one of the side conditions here is uh, uh, this, uh, this system has to be uh, easily updatable. Mm. So you might want to use a B tree, right? You don't, you don't want to use a hard array. You might be better off going to a B tree, which gives you incremental updating on the thing and still gives you pretty fast sorting. Yeah. Yeah. You know, of course, Smalltalk has any number of these. Yes. Different yeah. uh, kinds of things in it. And then your module. Is, which is called sort, is the thing that has the meaning. You've done the CAD SIM part to get the meaning. And then the FAB part is all the uh, all these optimized routines. And the rules should be, you should be able to turn off any and all of the optimizations in any part That's of right. the system and just have the system slow down. That's right, but and still working. It, if, and if that isn't true, then you've done a bad design. <laughs> Period. Yeah, that's simple. Yeah. You're, you're just playing at being an engineer yeah. in computing, or you're just playing at being a programmer even. Yeah, but uh, going to, to the last question. So what, what would you tell to, to a programmer today to, you know, to change the way we are working. What, what can we do? You know, a tiny people, can we do something or not? Yeah. Or, or should, I mean, because 
as you've mentioned many times, complexity currently in, in our, you know, development software right now is so complex. Uh, you know, working, doing web application is so much difficult today that doing applications like 20 years ago. Yeah, but, so, okay, it's, in some cases, you're just not going to beat the system. Yeah, that's, that's. In some cases, just not, because the, uh, the, what's imposed on you is just too much. Mm. However, like suppose you are doing web stuff. Yeah. Uh, so the, the first thing to notice is that underneath JavaScript is a dynamic language mm -hmm. subset of JavaScript uh, can be used as a real target from uh, other language development. Yeah, yeah. And because, uh, you know, there's a, a good garbage collector. Yeah, it, there's yeah, a lot it has of a good VM, yeah. And yeah. quite a bit of it is dynamic. It lacks a couple of reflection yeah. facilities, but I, I advise people who are doing things in JavaScript to do a thing that Alex Worth did years ago, mm -hmm. which mm -hmm. was to make a preprocessor for JavaScript. Mm. Yeah, there are many, so there are many things parse, like that today. Yeah. It just parses, so you feed JavaScript to it, mm -hmm. and it writes things in a way that uh, what you do is reflective, because mm. it yeah. adds that stuff in there. That's right, okay, okay. So the, so the basic idea is that for almost any programming language, uh, the chances that it's going to really fit what you need is low. Mm. And the whole point we that, do... That's why it should be open and with all the source code available, like Smalltalk. That helps. That helps a lot. Yeah. Helps, I'm sorry. But, sorry. Sorry to interrupt you. <laughs> yeah. But, in, but you know, Smalltalk, I, I don't advocate Smalltalk today because it was the, the world's greatest thing, really, in the 70s. Mm -hmm. But, uh, you know, what's interesting about Smalltalk today is how well it compares with more modern things, but that's because the more modern things are not very good. Mm. Small talk mm. is not uh, what I would use if I was going to do a major project today. Yeah, I would, okay. I would make, I would do what we do. You know, the other thing about that community back then is uh, it didn't bother us to do major tools. Yeah, that's right. Something that was part of our part of our skill set. So yeah, something that could, today we're still difficult at. It's like uh, we build no, tools for all the other. That's people, right. We build tools for other people, but not for us. <laughs> uh, well, it's that, but it's also just people not learning their field. Yeah, yeah. Most people are are happy to get paid for doing X. Yeah. And uh, that's not very professional. Mm. So if you're professional, you learn your field and. Uh, our our field is primarily there because software was invented, so we didn't have to put up with a fixed set mm. of facilities from hardware. Yeah, that's right. If you think right. about what that means, it means that if you have software, you should never have to put up yeah. a fixed set of anything, or else you're just treating... Uh, you're treating really badly designed software most of the time as though it's some sort of machine mm. that you can't do anything with. So this indirection principle, yeah. So I, I suggest just being subversive. <laughs> okay. uh, you basically, you start working on uh, a much better way of doing little parts of things. And at some point you can, uh, see if you can attract more people to doing this. You get a, you know, you you do it over lunch with beer. You gradually, but but before you do that, it helps. You know, the first ones you do, you're not going to want to use as tools. Yeah. yeah. But you have to get started. And if you are going to try and get around the problem that we have today then uh, you're going to have to be a lot more skilled than most programmers are. Mm. Um, mm. Yeah. So I, like I said, I was uh, 
kind of a standard program because I was used programming to work my way through college. So I didn't think of it as a central thing at all. Mm. I was I had a got a math degree and a biology degree, and I mm. pro programmed uh, to pay my tuition. Yeah. <laughs> but when I when I got into grad school, I was in this research community that was really serious about big things. And so, uh, but they also gave the grad students a lot of leeway. Uh, so uh, I had the time and the freedom and the resources there to just learn a whole bunch of things that yeah. mm -hmm. if I'd been more of a professional earlier on, I would have known, but I didn't know how to do a language. I didn't know how to do an operating mm -hmm. system. I didn't know how to do a system even. Okay. Just doing programs and, uh, you know, and, but a couple of years later, uh, I was more skilled on this and I understood uh, the group process of, because that graduate school, uh, ARPA did not require people to do individual theses. Mm. Mm, Although okay. usually you did, but usually but the, they, they allow you. They gave you the freedom to do whatever you thought it was. It was needed. in a it was in a big context, mm. and so the uh, you could work on big problems and you know write up the first two years of a big problem. Mm. If that was good, they'd give you a PhD. Cool. If you worked on so, smaller problems, uh, they wanted you to finish something in two years, mm. okay. but they didn't care. Okay. What they wanted was two years of world class work mm. to get to give out a PhD, and that's a night. And you didn't have to write little papers mm. with your professor's name on them or any of that stuff. Okay. Um, they didn't want you to write papers. And, well, uh, completely different to what it is today. <laughs> yeah. well, what they wanted you to do is to write a thesis. Mm. Right. Cool. That's the whole reason you're in grad school. It's not to write papers. It's <laughs> That's right. To get a degree. So, so they, they so, want you to do uh, world class stuff for two years in a row and write it up, and you, out you go. So <laughs> I was I was in grad school for two and a half years, and uh, and I wasn't I was not nearly the fastest fastest one out during my year uh, in that community was John Warnock. Mm. who is famous for doing Adobe. Oh, but, okay. But John was a uh, was a staff program. He, he had a math degree, had a master's in math, and he was working, he had a wife and a kid, and he was working as a staff programmer for the university. Mm. And one of the kids on the vet, grad, uh, grad school students went to him and asked him a question, and John saw a big answer to it that happened to be the first really good way to do continuous tone 3D graphics. <laughs> so he was the inventor of at that time <laughs> of that. And so his he was a grad student less than six months. And his thesis was actually 16 pages of text and nine pages of pictures. <laughs> Bingo, out he went and now, of course, he's a multimillionaire because of Adobe, but uh, <laughs> that, uh, so that was a good way of doing things back then because it, it emphasized not what you were doing in school. School was basically something that was a support system for doing the kinds of things you were going to do after school. That's right. That was the yeah. way they thought of it. And uh, so the, so the main thing about it is uh, there was a lot of scrambling, but there was not a lot of competition. Yeah, that's right. Because yeah. these ARPA yeah. grants for, were for entire departments. Mm. And so the professors weren't competing. The professors didn't have to worry about tenure. Mm. The graduate students weren't competing. Yes, it was a completely uh, different environment to what we see yeah. today. today. Yeah. So, but I, I like I like what you said that uh, we should be sub subversive <laughs> to try to change stuff. Oh, but that's what that's what software is. That's right. That's right. right. And, and science. It, the big problem with it is bad software is subversive in really terrible ways, <laughs> like the like the pollution. 
than I did. And yeah, yeah. so yeah. if you think about it, uh, you know, in medicine, you can you're allowed to put on a Band-Aid without a doctor's uh, degree, mm. but you're not allowed to do a heart operation without being certified and That's nothing right. like that exists in software in software yeah 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 and it's and if when when you get out of of college in in medicine you have to stay like uh, four years in in a hospital before doing real stuff you have to learn yeah yeah and yeah. so uh so to, to go to a serious subject it's if you know if you know about the boeing 737 max crash yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So my, one pilot, of my brothers is a pilot, and he used to to pilot that one. So yeah. So there you have an artificial intelligence that knows nothing important about mm -hmm. what it's doing, and uh, it was allowed to be made. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right? Even though yeah. there are people on board, it doesn't know anything about flying, because if you're at an altitude of a couple of hundred feet, you don't correct for a stall by diving the plane at the ground. That's right. Every pilot right. knows. So, so uh, Boeing allowed people to make a technological device that uh, should be called an artificial intelligence mm -hmm. because it does things that humans do. Mm. And, uh, but it has no boundaries, no certification. The people yeah. on board have no certification, and so uh, none of none of that is being taken seriously. And in medicine, the num the first thing in the Hippocratic Oath for yeah. doctors says, "Above all, do no harm." That's right. That's right. And yeah, no we don't have that, those kind of things. No such thing. No, no. And the equivalent in engineering is, "The bridge must not fall. The plane must not crash." And engineering is now starting to violate that. Mm. Yeah. They let that plane crash and there's no way you should ever let a plane crash. That's right. But, yeah. And so what's happening is this pop culture amateur. And I should, I, I like the term amateur because it means lover. Okay. So amateurs okay. Are not, but, but basically people who are not skilled enough for the responsibilities they have. Mm -hmm. are and may not realize it may not have the faintest idea they may think that that's right they've debugged it, one bubble sort program they know how to program and they're being hired right and left and writing yeah. gazillions of terrible code much of which is going to be is almost impossible to deal with you know so i i, I say well this is like a, a big fire mm. So in a big fire, you have to decide what parts you're going to just learn, let burn out. Mm. And other parts you have to isolate by driving okay. fire yeah. lanes through it and so forth. And if you think about what software is, it's exactly the same idea, right? You have to, uh, the much of the stuff, look, just to retreat back to something that should never have been allowed to happen is the way the web and the web browser was done. <laughs> I was I was going to ask you that question because there is well, one I think from the, the number one public. The number one telling thing to me is virtually no student I've met in undergraduate or graduate school at UCLA can tell me what's wrong with the web and the web browser. <laughs> and that means uh, the education in computing has completely failed. Yeah. Because they only teach you what we use right now and know what used to yeah. be or the and principles that, or the that principles. takes us full circle to where we started, which is people are projecting their beliefs on the world. Mm. Like one of the most pernicious beliefs in computing is uh, simple Darwinism. Yeah. Okay. That we must have the best stuff in the world today. Yeah. <laughs> and I used to give lots of talks until I gave up showing stuff from the past that's infinitely better than this stuff today. No, yeah. because they think Darwinism optimizes and it doesn't optimize, it just fits. Yeah, that's so right. If you have a stupid environment, you're going to wind up with, with uh, a stupid result stuff. of evolution. And that's what we've got. Mm. Remember, the 
a really important thing is that people were probably as clever from the IQ standpoint 100,000 years ago as they are today. Yeah. yeah. Right? But uh, the so uh, ignorance resembles stupidity. <laughs> You can be clever as hell, but if you don't know anything, you might not be clever enough to to get around that. And Liam, well, my, really my, my grandfather, people. my grandfather used to say that it is worse an ignorant person than a, a, a dumb person, because somebody that is ignorant doesn't know it, and that makes more more yeah, harm than that somebody do. that yeah yeah. That's if you hard. have a smart per person who thinks they know it and they don't, yeah. So and that's. Basically, I think computing attracts that kind of personality. Mm. There used to be, and also it attracts a personality that tends not to like humans very much. They're more why, comfortable why, why with, that? with Well, I think it's because, uh, you know, many people in computing uh, have Asperger's. I have a mm. bit myself. Mm. And it's comforting to deal with machinery. Yeah, yeah. Because you don't have to negotiate with it. Yeah, that's right. That's right. And it doesn't have all of these. You don't have to be polite. Yeah, you know? yeah. Uh, you don't have to try and figure out what the the other person is thinking about. You don't have to do all of these things. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And so the thing that saved me was doing theater. Mm. Whereas theater is the perfect thing for a person who is uncomfortable around people. Mm. Because you have to because it's theater is basically the an anthropological a way of getting at the anthropology of humanity <laughs> interesting so, yeah because if you understand why theater can work if you think about what it is and think yeah. about why people can wind up crying in a completely artificial situation yeah okay you yeah, understand yeah. how to arrange things so that happens you understand a lot about people, even if you're still uncomfortable with them. Mm. But you understand more about what's going on. And you also uh, have the understanding needed to design a decent user interface. If you don't have that, uh, the user interfaces you'll make are hopeless. Yeah. And you'll retreat into the clever world of simple machinery, except it's not that simple. Yeah. So it's very possible to for people to create these bubbles that they live in that really have nothing to do. Certainly, if you look at uh, the software I've looked at, it's too much software to make a blanket statement about the whole world. Mm. Now, but the software that I've looked at in uh, ma mainly in very large companies and in uh, the government uh, indicates that hardly anybody uh, who is good at design was ever in the process mm. because mm. the objective is to get things done quickly on time and in budget yeah. and not worry about the future. And that's where we get all the trash in the Pacific oh, cool. Ocean from. That's right. That's it's right. all yeah. about getting the, the bottle of water to you quickly and cheaply. Yeah. Yeah. And who cares where the bottle goes afterwards? That's right. That's so right. That's, that's basically why I use that analogy to start off my talk that it's it works very well uh unfortunately software is much more invisible than the trash in the pacific ocean because you can't take pictures of you know gazillions of terabytes of crap you can get an idea by looking at a company that should be doing a lot better uh, like Google and ask the question, how is it possible that when you retrieve some, something using Google, that it's not showing you little summaries of those web pages? What it's doing is just picking random stuff out of the web pages, but it's, it has to index the web pages to be able to do the retrieval at all. So why aren't they indexing the, uh, the web pages by looking to see what the web pages are about? and putting that in there as meta information. Why after all of these years? Now, of course, I've asked my friends at Google many times, you guys are doing all of this stuff. You've got AI chips to do this and 
pictures and that, but you can't do the most elementary thing in your primary product to make it any better than it was uh, 25 years ago, right? So what's the problem? Can you hear me? Hello, hello, can't hear you. See, I was complaining about the web and it took revenge. Hello, Hernan? Yes. C can you hear me now? Yes. Yes. No, I don't know what happened. Something went wrong with my... Yeah. Well, I was, I was complaining microphone. about the, the web and it took revenge. Yeah. <laughs> so what I, I was asking you, what did they say when you told them that? When you asked them that? Well, like, I don't you know. It, I, I haven't tried it on them recently, but I used to, every couple of months, I'd send Peter Norvig a, an email. He's a good guy. <laughs> And he was in charge of all this stuff. And well, he went to the, basically the, the one of the ways of looking at it and you could ask them why. Mm -hmm. But one of the things that really did happen and I think it has to do with how school, once you start valuing A's in school, mm -hmm. yeah. that sets yeah. up an evolutionary pro process that makes the problems progressively easier. Mm -hmm. Right, because people mm -hmm. complain if they don't get an A, if they're valuable. That's right. That's right. And, and the it. only goal for them is that. Yeah. Yeah. Then you have to go to easier and easier problems rather than, uh, and so I think what happened is certainly with uh, AI, which is actually a hard problem. Mm -hmm. What they did was to substitute uh, various forms of machine learning, and uh, you know, perceptron. Mm -hmm. type stuff, which is which is basically, you know, w one part of our brain, fair, fair amount of our brain does a lot of that. Yeah. But so do, so do pigeons. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So yeah. they decided to, uh, and the nice, for them, the nice thing is, is that Cohonan years ago showed that certain forms of matrix algebra were isomorphic to simple perceptrons. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden that meant, so that wasn't always known. Okay. It was a guy, Tubo. Mm, I don't know. Yeah. yeah, well, he was the guy who did that. And uh, it put a mathematical basis on it. And it suddenly allowed academics to write papers with math in them. Mm -hmm. And since they were supposed to write papers, uh, all of a sudden, academic AI shifted abruptly yeah from just just machine learning and giving up what is now called general ai yeah yeah, uh, yeah. this is like i have to call object oriented programming dynamic object oriented programming <laughs> now or, or real object oriented programming <laughs> because, <laughs> because the term i made up was taken away from me and the same thing as the the term that mccarthy made up which was you know in which machine learning was a tiny, tiny part. That's right. That's uh, right. Taken away from him, yeah. uh, and, and change, uh, change, change the meaning of the word. Yeah. Yeah. And so, uh, a friend of a friend of mine uh, actually wrote a paper somewhere about this uh, thing, and he called it colonization. Mm. Colonization. When something is successful, everybody wants in on it, and so the uh, they get it by colonizing the term. Mm, okay. <laughs> in, 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 uh, in American uh, K through 12 uh, mathematics. Yeah. Uh, they tried to reform it. Yeah. And they got so much pushback that they solved the problem by renaming arithmetic mathematics. <laughs> and, and so that was the solution. Mathematics in school. 
But <laughs> this is, you have to realize this is the world that we live in, the pop culture that we live in. Yeah, that's right. It's yeah. all about labels. Mm. Mm. It's about designer jeans. Mm. Buying a T-shirt with a label on it. You got one right on, on you right now. There you go. <laughs> that gives you the illusion that you understand what I yeah. meant. Yeah, of course. Well, it gives other people the illusion. <laughs> thank you, thank you for, you know, <laughs> make me feel like that. <laughs> no, but think about it, because do you know what I really meant? Well, I think so, but I'm not sure, you know. <laughs> well, you know, I'm on email, so. I, 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 I know the I've history. Very, I, I read that in the book, but I'm not sure if I understand exactly I've, what you meant. I've gotten very few emails about this because people love these slogans. Yeah. This is yeah. why people love organized religion. Mm -hmm. Because the the slogan sounds good. Yeah. Yeah. But you have to realize a slogan is the the shortest story you can tell. That's right. That's right. And you don't have the context, so it's the meaning it could be anything. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. so well no, the meaning can be what they want it to be. Oh yeah, that's that's better. Yeah, that's. By the way, there is a university building in Paderborn, Germany. Yeah, that has your phrase in there. Yeah, the I whole saw yeah. building. And when I went, they asked me to come celebrate it, and I asked the audience whether they knew what I meant. <laughs> so I showed them some of the variations. Um, okay. Of the, and it's like like point of view is worth eighty IQ points, which is another yeah. favorite one. It's on T-shirts and. Yeah. But I, I didn't say whether the sign was plus or minus. <laughs> Good point. <laughs> and and but, having a weak point of view uh, makes you appear less smart than you actually are. Hmm. And the same thing with the best way to predict the future is to in, invent it. It doesn't say anything about uh, whether it's a good future. Mm -hmm. You want to mm -hmm. see people inventing the future, take a look at Washington and Wall Street. Okay. Uh, yeah. There, yeah, and take a look at well, the planet. Uh, the best way to predict the future is to invent it. They've they've invented a future in which the the planet is dying. Yeah. So. Yeah. yeah so this is what I'm saying. These these slogans. I, I started making up. See, I think in terms of paragraphs, you can tell by the fact that I talk and talk and talk and talk. And the reason <laughs> is, is that I'm basically a book guy. I don't think in terms of sentences, and I don't think in terms of slogans. But I started making up these slogans when at at Xerox, when when I realized the executives couldn't deal with three sentences. With the slogan, uh, mm. and what they needed was something that sounded good to them. <laughs> a so good I, way to, to make them question. think what you wanted. Yeah. Yeah, it's like when I give a talk. Uh, the a talk is just a, a commercial for doing a lot of work. Mm. And most people uh, try to use the talk as an actual source of knowledge, and it can't be. Mm. Look at the world that we live in. This world was not made from oral discourse. This mm. world was made by thousands and thousands of these things. Yeah. These yeah. books. That's right. It's not made from what we're doing right now. So if, if this but, session you know, that you had you, does What you're saying and, you, and your talks help us to understand a little bit more of what is going on. And I, well, think, I think the it's... number one thing to take from any talk of mine is, wow, whatever I'm thinking might not be right. That's right. Yeah. That's it's, all. Uh, that's, don't that's, that's don't want to listen to what I say. That's right. You have to doubt about everything because that's the only way to yeah. get, you know, to know and know even more. Yeah. So people I think... make the mistake of thinking that I know the answers yeah. and I don't, but I am a professional thinker. So what I do know how to do is to doubt my own thinking. Yeah. So and most people can't, can't do that. Alan, uh, you know, we have to, uh, you know, the time is up. Uh, I, you know, I would love to be like talking for more like, I don't know, 20 hours, 40 hours, <laughs> all the time you could give us. But uh, at this time we have to, to end. And I think the last thing, the last thing that you said is how we can, you know, wrap up uh, the whole thing. Um, I really appreciate your talk and it was amazing for me, a pleasure 
to be able to talk to you personally. I, I, I wanted to go to London this year, as I told you in the email, uh, to the conference of the History of Programming Languages. Sadly, it wasn't done uh, because of the COVID. But anyway, um, I think everybody enjoyed your talk and everything that you teach us today and you told us today. And uh, I hope to see you someday and for everybody to keep enjoying well, what you think. London is a great place to live. Oh, well. I haven't, I haven't been out of my flat here since the last week in February. Oh, <laughs> whoa. Yeah. <laughs> because, uh, yeah. Yeah, they have, one, they have one of the worst death rates uh, in yeah. the world here in the UK. So, yeah. and I'm a bio, I'm former biologist, so. So you, I, you better be careful. We want you to live more. Oh, I am. <laughs> uh, my wife and I are careful. We're really uh, careful. Okay. Okay, Alan, thank you very much. I, I don't know if you want to finish saying something small. Uh, that's yeah, more than enough. <laughs> okay. It's been, it's been a, a, a tremendous pleasure. Thank you. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.